Hello, hello, hello YouTube, it's Hauntown here and today we're gonna be diving into the past in order to unearth six horror games from the PlayStation 2 era that have been lost in the annals of time. It's no secret that the PS2 is widely considered to be the most successful video game console of all time, having sold approximately 158 millions of units worldwide and during its incredibly successful run it bequeathed upon us some of the best horror games to have ever been conjured up by the human mind. Now while many of those games have been branded in our brains because of how incredibly terrifying and ahead of their time they were, such as Resident Evil 2, Silent Hill 4 The Room, Resident Evil Code Veronica, and Clock Tower 3. There are quite a few of them that didn't leave a huge mark despite of how exceptionally intriguing and creepy they were, and it is those games that I wish to bring back to the limelight, kicking and screaming. Full disclosure, a couple of the games on this list were not PS2 exclusives, but it was on that console that I experienced them first, so in my heart they are. Thus, my friends, let's get into my time machine and turn back the clock in order to have a look at the PS2 horror games that time forgot. Back in 2000, when the PlayStation 2 first released, I didn't have the money to get it, which kinda sucked for me since I had grown up with the first PlayStation and was really looking forward to the wonders of the second one. During December of that year, a friend of mine called me and said that his parents had purchased the PS2 for him with a single game and then proceeded to invite me over for us to try it out together. Excited beyond belief, I got dressed and rushed to his home, at which point he showed me this. Extermination was probably the most fitting way for me to start my journey with the PS2 for a couple of different reasons. First, First, it was actually the first survival horror game to be released for the console, since it had also been used extensively at trade shows to demonstrate what the system was capable of. Second, its setting reminded me of one of my favorite horror films of all time, namely The Thing by John Carpenter, which made the whole experience even more incredible. Extermination transpires at an isolated research facility in Antarctica and follows Sergeant Dennis Riley, a US Marine who is sent there along with a team of soldiers to investigate a distress signal. As you would expect, things turn out to be quite horrific as Dennis and his team come face to face with a deadly virus strain that turns everything it infects into hideous abominations, forcing him to fight for his life as well as the lives of other people he meets. What was truly special about Extermination was its infection system, which really put the pressure on you throughout your playthrough. Essentially, the monsters and environment in the game had the potential to infect Dennis with the virus, with the percentage of infection being visible through a special infection rate bar. Said infection could be managed by utilizing a limited supply of items, and if it reached 100%, game over, so you can realize the amount of stress this mechanic induced to me back then. Extermination received a mixed reception upon release, but to this day I cannot help but admire its visuals, atmosphere and story, and even its campy voice acting which I believe added to the overall charm of the game. If you're someone who grew up in the 90s, chances are you have associated the name Midway with the Mortal Kombat series, and with good reason, those games were epic. But what if I told you that Midway was also responsible for publishing one of the most brutal action horror titles back in 2004? Ominously called The Suffering, the game thrusts you into the role of Torque, a man sentenced to death for murdering his family though he has no recollection of the incident. Torque gets incarcerated in an infamous prison on Carnet Island to await his demise, but it's not long after the cell door closes behind him him that the power goes out and screams start echoing across the halls. Turns out the place has come under attack by a legion of indescribable monstrosities and he's part of the main course. The suffering featured some of the most disturbing and violent imagery I had ever come across, even so many years after a good number of horror games had already come out, and that went double for the sick and twisted abominations you had to fight against, all of which looked like the worst result of what could happen to the human body if it went through a meat grinder and then stitched back together by a psychopath. The suffering really stayed with me for two main reasons. The first one was the aforementioned dark brutality that permeated its every story beat, which really made you feel like you were fighting for your life every step of the way even though Torque himself was an unstoppable killing machine. The second was its morality system, meaning that throughout your nightmarish gauntlet against these creatures you would come across situations where you'd have to make a choice, for example to mercy kill somebody or let them die slowly, and depending on your decisions your appearance actually changed, with a good morality level reflected on you through a healthy physique while a bad one turning you more demonic. Morality also determined which of the game's three endings you would get, giving The Suffering some welcome replayability value. A sequel was released in 2005 called The Suffering Ties That Bind, which concludes Tork's story, but I never got to play that one even though I heard good things about it. The Suffering is leaning more toward the action rather than the survival aspect of horror, but trust me when I say that this game can bring on some brutal scares like few others can.
Do you dislike ships? I dislike ships. I'm always unnerved by how they're constantly at the whims of the waves and wind, just sailing over a watery abyss. That being said, there was one particular game that came out back in 2005 that made me fear ships for a whole different number of reasons, and the name of that game was Cold Fear. Cold Fear dumps you on the deck of a huge whaler boat in the middle of a thunderstorm as Tom Hansen, a member of the United States Coast Guard who is responding to a distress call and soon finds himself knee-deep in trouble when he realizes that something inhuman is lurking in the shadows of the ship. The game featured an awesome ambience of dread, at least during its first half, and some great shooting segments, but what made it truly stand out from the crowd of other survival horror titles was its boat and water physics. As mentioned previously, the whaler is caught right in the middle of a ferocious thunderstorm that causes the waves to smack the vessel left and right like a ragdoll, causing you to dance around like a demented ballerina as you try to not get thrown overboard. In fact, there's an actual gauge that keeps track of your resistance levels which allows you to hang on to the side of the boat if the sea throws you off the deck. And if said levels drop to zero, well, prepare for a watery grave. Cold Fear had the misfortune to release close to Resident Evil 4, which caused many people to compare it unfavorably to Capcom's Juggernaut entry, but I still consider it to be a very good survival horror game even though it failed to maintain the tension and mystery it established during its opening hours. In the distant past of 2006, an intense moral panic started taking over Europe, and in the center of that maelstrom was a game that had the audacity to prominently feature one of the most disgusting, disturbing and outright terrifying creatures known to man as its main villain, CHILDREN. Say hello to Rule of Rose. The game transpires in England during 1930 and follows a 19-year-old girl named Jennifer, who gets abducted by a group of kids that call themselves the Red Rose Aristocracy and taken to an airship where she is forced to bring them monthly gifts or else endure their humiliating punishments with the ultimate sentence for failure being death at the claws of an entity known as Stray Dog. Rule of Rose is by far one of the most controversial games to have ever been released, so much so that there were actual political figures advocating for its banned because, as they said, it contained obscene cruelty and brutality as well as some other dreadful things that I won't mention because they're horrible and they have to do with children. As you would expect, all those accusations were complete bullshit spouted by people who had never actually played the game and had just seen the trailer and imagined certain things based on its overall vibe. Rule of Rose was notable for its influences drawn from Silent Hill for its psychological approach to horror, as well as the fact that Jennifer, our protagonist, wasn't really a fighter and had to rely on hit and run tactics to survive. The game also featured a significant number of puzzles, many of which required the assistance of Brown, a dog companion you find early on, in order to be solved, with your canine friend also being able to find items for you as well as distract enemies. Arguably the standout feature of Rule of Rose was its story, which went really deep in its exploration of the human psyche as well as the mentality of children when behaving without the concepts of guilt or sin in mind. Was Rule of Rose a disturbing experience? Yes, yes it was. Was it the inappropriate abomination the media back then made it out to be? Not by a long shot. I'll admit the game did make me feel a bit uncomfortable at times, but that was due to how unsettling certain character personalities were, which just goes to show how well written and fleshed out the overall experience was. Do you remember the Clock Tower games? I do. As far as I can recall, it was the first video game series to introduce the gimmick of you playing as a helpless young girl that's hunted by psychopaths with very limited means of defending yourself. I happened to play the first one on the PS1 back in 1996, which had terrified me, and then had an equally stressful time with Clock Tower 3 back in 2002. For a few years after that, I wondered whether Capcom would ever continue the series, but found myself disappointed since they never released a new entry. Well, turns out they kinda did, I just never made the connection until much later. In 2005, Capcom graced us with a game called Haunting Ground, which told the story of Fiona Belly, an 18-year-old girl that experiences a car accident which claims the lives of her parents and causes her to lose consciousness, only to wake up sometime later and find herself trapped inside a massive gothic castle. As you would expect, said castle turns out to be home to some incredibly disturbing and creepy individuals, all of whom seem to have a very unhealthy interest in her and her body. Thankfully for Fiona, she is not 
not alone when facing this freak show since she befriends a dog early in the game, who helps her survive and fend off her attackers. Haunting Ground was interesting for a variety of different reasons. First, its story was, for lack of a better term, weird in a somewhat engaging way, since it dealt with some uncomfortable subject matter while at the same time making you care about the safety of Fiona, she was pursued by individuals who definitely wanted to do her harm, each for their own reasons. Second, Fiona wasn't a fighter, and had to either run and hide or make use of environmental hazards in order to hinder her enemies, something that added to the overall feeling of vulnerability you felt while playing. Third, the dog didn't immediately like you from the get-go, and you had to build trust with him by petting and feeding him in order to make sure he always looked out for you. Finally, if Fiona found herself in incredibly dangerous situations, she ran the risk of going into full-blown panic mode, which pretty much removed control of her from you and caused her to run around frantically on her own with limited visibility and bump into walls, making her easy prey. Haunting Ground is one of the most beautiful and unsettling games I have ever played, and featured some really cool plot twists, though I'll admit it never really reached the grotesque heights of the Clock Tower series despite being considered its spiritual successor. If there's something strange in your neighborhood, who you gonna call? Lazarus Jones! Got you, didn't I? Did you ever wonder what would happen if you combined the ghost hunting shenanigans of Ghostbusters with the visceral intensity of Resident Evil? Well, Sonny did, and then breathed unholy life into Ghost Hunter. Ghost Hunter, which came out back in 2003, follows Lazarus Jones, epic name by the way, a rookie detective from the Detroit Police Department who accidentally releases a crapload of evil ghosts from confinement after he goes to investigate a disturbance call at a local high school while at the same time having his partner abducted by a mean-looking apparition. Talk about an eventful first day on the job, am I right? Obligated to fix the mess he made, Jones embarks on a fight for survival across time in order to recapture the ghosts and save his partner. Luckily enough, he has a ghost that took a liking to him by his side, who can be used in a variety of different ways, from solving puzzles and passing through walls, all the way to distracting or controlling enemies. Ghost Hunter is widely considered to be one of the most good-looking games of the PS2 era. I mean, it may be hard to see it now, but back Back then, its graphics and animations were considered absurdly realistic and nearly a benchmark for the console. Unfortunately, its gameplay received a lot of criticism for its linearity as well as the overall length of the game, which I'll admit I never agreed with, I just loved every second of it. I mean, for crying out loud, you got to capture ghosts using a grenade, did the Ghostbusters ever do that? By the way, I love the Ghostbusters, just to avoid any misunderstandings, they truly rock. I still remember playing Ghost Hunter for the first time back in 2003 and just being unable to believe my eyes when it came to its visuals which were complemented by an equally awesome story. Unfortunately, its mixed reception led to it never getting a sequel, which was a bummer, but I still hope that one day Ghost Hunter will make a triumphantly creepy return with a new adventure featuring good old Jones. Welcome to the end, my good people. These were the six PlayStation 2 horror games that the world cruelly forgot, perhaps unfairly, I might add. If you reached this part of our scary journey through the past, I salute you and would like to know which horror game did you really enjoy that ended up being lost in the sands of time. Feel free to subscribe for more creepiness and remember to stay spooky.